It is March 19th, 2019, and a medical helicopter has just landed at an emergency scene in Union Center, South Dakota. The medical crew has just exited the aircraft when suddenly the waiting ambulance starts to drive towards the helicopter while the main rotor is still turning. The ambulance does not stop and drives directly into the moving main rotor blades of the helicopter, pretty much destroying the helicopter and the ambulance. How could this have happened? Did the driver of the ambulance not see the helicopter blades? And what is an ambulance driver anyway? Coming up on this episode of The Dr. Medic. This aircraft was a beautiful Bell 407 medical helicopter owned and operated by Air Methods Corporation under the local name of Black Hills Life Flight. The aircraft was built in 2013 and had a total of 2,105 hours of flight time on the airframe. This is an amazing helicopter that is basically the successor of the famous Bell 206, which is still flown by many air medical services in the US. But the 407 has a slightly larger interior, four blades instead of two, and a 650 horsepower Rolls-Royce turboshaft engine. The pilot was a 36-year-old male who had a total of 2,138 total hours of flight time with 130 hours on this type of aircraft. This night was a blistering cold with temperatures nearing 10 degrees below zero Fahrenheit with 10 to 15 knot winds. A little bit of background in helicopter EMS is needed here. In many parts of the world, helicopters are a vital resource for their communities as they are providing advanced and critical life-saving care but they also provide that care with a very quick response time and very quick transport times to the hospital after they pick up their patient. In general, most medical helicopters, at least in the United States, are called upon by other first responders who made first patient contact. In these cases, a firefighter, an EMT, a paramedic, or even a law enforcement officer may arrive on the scene of an emergency first, assess the situation, and then determine if the patient will need rapid treatment and transport by a medical helicopter. In most busy urban systems such as Atlanta or Dallas or Los Angeles, for instance, these patients are mostly trauma patients. But in the most rural areas of the United States, such as in South Dakota and much of the Midwest, these helicopters may also be called to an emergency scene due to medical reasons such as patients having heart attacks, strokes, or even severe respiratory issues. In the most rural parts of the U.S., these helicopters may play a role far above and beyond that of just rapidly treating and transporting patients. They also are very active in their communities. The flight nurse and flight medic typically will participate in a lot of education for local EMS agencies and fire departments. They may attend high schools, local volunteer fire departments, and smaller local hospitals, all in the name of improving public relations and providing a lot of free public outreach education. While doing all of these outreach education events, they are also forming relationships and getting to know the local first responders. This is a wonderful thing because things are usually very tense and somewhat stressful during emergency scenes and major trauma events, and it is always a bit calming when the medical crew of the helicopter already has some positive relationships with those providers that are on the ground. Probably the number one way in which medical helicopters accomplish this outreach education is by delivering what we call landing zone classes, otherwise known as LZ classes. These classes are absolutely paramount to the safety of the medical crew, the ground providers, and the patient anytime that a helicopter is landing in an emergency scene. These scenes can be very unpredictable and dangerous, and there are many opportunities for mistakes to happen and for someone to be hurt or killed. Typically, an EMT or paramedic on an ambulance will arrive at an emergency scene, assess the patient, 
and then determine whether or not air transport is warranted. If it is warranted, they will call their dispatch center, who will then call the helicopter's dispatch center, who will then dispatch the helicopter to the scene. While the helicopter is en route to the emergency scene, the EMTs and paramedics are providing patient care in the back of an ambulance, while the local fire department and law enforcement work together to set up a safe landing zone for the helicopter to land once they arrive on the scene. The landing zone must be a safe area where the helicopter can land, and once they land, the crew will depart the aircraft and they usually enter the back of the ambulance. Once in the back of the ambulance, the flight crew may provide a few minutes of life-saving care to assist the ground crew with packing up the patient, and then will move the patient back to their aircraft where they will load them into the helicopter, do some quick safety checks, and then depart the scene for the most appropriate hospital. These LZ classes are meant to teach the ground first responders on how to safely set up this scene. They need to choose an area that is flat and level and free from overhead obstructions like power lines and trees. The LZ should typically be about 75 by 75 feet during daylight hours and maybe 100 by 100 feet during night hours. The flight crew will also discuss emergency procedures with the fire department so they can know the proper way to turn off the power to the aircraft, kill the engine if they cannot get inside the cockpit, turn off a fuel supply, and even to apply the rotor brake. One of the most important factors they discuss though is when to safely approach the aircraft and how to safely approach the aircraft. Depending on the situation or the aircraft, some patients are hot loaded where the patient is loaded into the aircraft with the engines running and blades turning and other times they will cold load the patient where the engine is off and the rotor blades have come to a stop. It is these rotor blades that create the most danger during these LZs. If the ground is not flat, these blades can easily drop below the height of a grown adult's head while walking under the moving blades, which we call the rotor disc. Also, if they are hot loading the patient, the pilot could always accidentally move the cyclic, causing the blades to drop even further. And the tail rotor is by far the most dangerous area of any running helicopter. Why? Well, the main reason is that when this tail rotor is spinning, especially at night, it is nearly impossible to tell that it is moving. And if you cannot tell that it is moving, you certainly cannot tell where the very ends of the blades are and it can be very deceiving. There have been many, many cases over the years where people have straight up walked directly into the moving tail rotor of a helicopter, killing them instantly. Having any persons walking under the rotors can be dangerous if they are still moving. This danger can be mitigated by some helicopters that have their own stretcher system, which could effectively ensure that no other people are walking under the rotor disc as the flight medic and nurse could easily transport the stretcher from the aircraft to the ambulance, get the patient, and return to the aircraft without any assistance. In order to accomplish this, they would need to have an aircraft that can hold a full-size stretcher, such as a BK-117, an EC-135, an EC-145, a Bell 429, or even some medium-sized helicopters such as an Augusta AW-139 or a Sikorsky S-76. But these aircraft can cost upwards of seven, nine, 10, or 12 or 13 million dollars. These are big aircraft with twin engines and room for a big stretcher in the back. And while this is very safe and much more efficient for the flight crew, it is also wildly expensive and is simply not cost effective in every community. Most of the helicopters that exist across the US are high performance, lightweight helicopters such as the Bell 206 and the Bell 407, the A-Star 350 and the EC-130. These type of helicopters have far less room inside of them and therefore do not have room for a full-size stretcher. In these cases, they utilize what is called a patient litter system where the bed or litter is easily removed from the aircraft but must be transported on a hospital bed or another EMS stretcher. But how do they get the EMS stretcher over to the aircraft? Well, 
They would typically have the ground EMS crew wheel the patient over on their own stretcher all the way up to the aircraft where they will then transfer the patient from the EMS stretcher over to the helicopter litter system. It is during this time where the highest danger exists as everyone is focused on the patient and there can be many dangers to pay attention to, especially the moving rotors. It is worth noting that some helicopters have a massively improved safety system when it comes to their tail rotor with what we call a Finistron tail. These Finistron tails, you've probably seen them on big Coast Guard helicopters or some medical helicopters, do amazing things. And the number one thing that they do is they mitigate the safety issue that could come from having somebody in the back of the aircraft. They don't have an external tail rotor and instead the blades of the tail rotor are contained within the tail of the helicopter. This creates a big whale tail of a helicopter, but it makes things safer and they're actually a lot quieter as well. You could find this on a lot of Eurocopter models such as the EC-130, 135, the new Eurocopter H-145, and even the Dauphin helicopter. So, how is all this safety stuff normally mitigated and dealt with by these crews? Well, in the LZ class, one of the most important lessons to learn is twofold. One, never approach the aircraft from the rear. And two, never approach the aircraft until you have visual or verbal authorization from the pilot. This would include making eye contact with a pilot who will give hand signals to either wait outside the rotor disc or wave them in to approach the aircraft. Black Hills Life Flight was based out of Spearfish, South Dakota at the Black Hills Airport. At the date in question, at 2310 hours, they were dispatched to an emergency scene flight in Enning, South Dakota. The weather was extremely cold that night and it took the crew a bit longer than usual to take off, leaving the airport at 2337 hours. The ground EMS and fire department crew set up a landing zone at Union Center, and en route to the scene, the flight crew did receive a briefing from the ground crew. Upon arriving in the area, the pilot did perform a standard high reconnaissance flight where the pilot flies in a circular pattern around the scene on his or her side of the aircraft in order to get a good view of the LZ and take note of possible wind direction, as well as any possible obstacles or hazards. In this incident, all crew members noted that the waiting ambulance was sitting there stationary during their landing. The pilot then landed the aircraft safely. He reduced the collective and then rolled back the throttle to the idle position. And as with any turbine engine, this aircraft cannot simply just shut down quickly and instead requires a bit of a cool down period. It is during this cooldown period that it might be routine for the medical crew to exit the aircraft with their equipment and start making their way over to the waiting ambulance. However, in this case, while the medical crew were gathering their gear, the ambulance began to drive towards the helicopter, which caused an immediate impact with the rotor blades. The pilot immediately closed the throttle, turned off the fuel, and pulled the rotor brake. During this time, the blades of the aircraft, the tail boom, and the ambulance were all substantially damaged. When the rotor blades initially struck the ambulance, the flight medic was thrown to the ground as the aircraft violently rocked back and forth for a second or two, and the medic was forced to do everything that he could to keep his legs from getting pinned underneath the left skid of the helicopter. Luckily, he was able to keep his leg above the skid and suffered only minor injuries. The flight nurse, the pilot, and all occupants of the ambulance were not injured. The pilot immediately called the Air Methods Operational Control Center, or OCC, and requested another aircraft be dispatched for the patient, and he also started the post-accident incident plan. This ambulance had a somewhat unique crew makeup. Most ambulances would be staffed by an EMT and a paramedic, and both of them might share driving duties, or in some places, the EMT may do most of the driving. In this case, according to the reports, the medical crew of the ambulance consisted of two medical providers in the back of the ambulance. It is unknown if they were both EMTs or if one was an EMT and one was a paramedic. 
but both of them were in the back of the ambulance with a third person who was specifically tasked with driving the ambulance. As I will talk about in another video, EMTs and paramedics are highly educated individuals who go through quite a bit of education and training in order to be experts in their profession. Oftentimes, they may be called an ambulance driver by the media or members of the public, and it is not uncommon for them to feel quite insulted by this title as they are obviously far more than just ambulance drivers. However, when reviewing the reports from this incident, it is clear that the person driving this ambulance actually did hold the title of ambulance driver. The ambulance driver did state that as driver of the Faith Ambulance, I rolled the ambulance ahead to get closer. I didn't realize that the helicopter blades were still rotating. While the helicopter sustained damage that certainly rendered it unflyable, the ambulance was actually still able to drive. Even though it had a gaping hole in the roof, to another landing zone about a quarter mile away where the ambulance crew transferred the patient over to another medical helicopter. So how did this happen? Well, at a minimum, it is clear that the driver lost situational awareness and did not realize that the rotor blades were still turning. The driver certainly did not do this on purpose and did make a mistake. We all make mistakes. The flight crew and the pilot all followed all of their previous training and procedures and simply did not have the opportunity to stop the ambulance from driving into the rotor disc before it was too late. The National Transportation Safety Boards, or NTSB, final report found that the probable cause of this accident was the ambulance driver's failure to see the helicopter's rotating main rotor blades in dark night conditions, which resulted in the ambulance's inadvertent collision with the helicopter. Contributing to the accident was the ambulance driver's failure to follow procedures when approaching the helicopter. A review of Air Method's LZ training curriculum for ground providers did indicate that ground personnel are not to approach the aircraft until the blades have stopped rotating. This training curriculum also noted that ground personnel will not come beneath the rotor disc until directed to do so by the pilot in command and that the pilot will use appropriate hand signals to do so. Air Methods was able to confirm that the ambulance driver had received their landing zone training. This ended up being an accident that was not caused by pilot error or a lack of education, but rather an accident that was caused by multiple small failures that led up to the actual hazard. There is a theoretical model for this that we call the Swiss cheese model. This model was developed to visually illustrate that any time that major accidents or catastrophic system failures occur, they are not usually caused by a single issued or hazard. Instead, each slice of the Swiss cheese represents a safety barrier or precaution relevant to that particular hazard. The only way for an accident to occur is for each slice of the Swiss cheese to line up just perfectly, allowing a failure for each of the smaller safety barriers that then leads to the main catastrophic failure. In this case, the ambulance driving into the rotor disc. In this situation, one slice of the Swiss cheese could be that the ambulance driver was not an EMT or a paramedic. EMTs and paramedics, on top of all their medical training and education, are also educated in what we call EMS operations during their initial EMS education, a part of which does include EMS helicopter operations and landing zones. It is possible that this extra level of education that an EMT and paramedic possess would have functioned as a stronger slice of that Swiss cheese. Now, remember a few minutes ago, I said that this was not about a lack of education. And in this case, it's not necessarily that an EMT or a paramedic would know more maybe about landing zones. It's more that they would have had the point stressed to them. It would have been tested on them and it would have been a part of a required training and education to become an EMT or a paramedic in the first place, as opposed to an outreach education class where there's really not any accountability if the people who are receiving the education don't re remember the material or don't understand the material. 
It is also possible that the medical crew in the back of the ambulance could have reminded the ambulance driver to keep the ambulance stationary and to not move the ambulance until the flight crew approached the ambulance. A lot of these ambulances have little tunnels between the back and the front, and maybe they could have screamed up front and said, hey, just remember, do not approach until the flight crew comes over to the aircraft. But it would make sense that the medical crew was preoccupied with taking care of the patient who was obviously sick enough to need the rapid treatment and transport of the flight crew and the helicopter. Again, it's just one more slice of the Swiss cheese to help mitigate the risk. Although Air Methods performed a thorough root cause analysis and found that all of their crew procedures were in accordance with their current general operating procedures, they still chose to assess to determine if alternate procedures might help to mitigate the likelihood of this type of accident happening again in the future. Now, I'm not sure if they updated their training following this incident, but it is clear that at least they assessed the possibility of doing so. In the end, no one was killed or seriously injured, and you can be sure that each and every person that was involved with this incident will use this as a valuable learning experience in the future. I do hope that you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please throw me a like and a subscription as this helps me to make more videos. I do appreciate you taking the time to watch, and I truly hope that each and every one of you has a beautiful rest of your day.